Good morning, students. Uh, we just waited a little while there. There were lots and lots of students joining us from about a minute to 11. But anyway, we're going to start now. <clears throat> now, last week, um, last week, let me just confirm that you can all hear me. If you can just type yes or no, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If anyone had typed no there, then I would have known that you could, could hear me in any case. <laughs> okay. So last week we had a look at um, uh, businesses in general. So we had a look at business structures. We had a look at the types of businesses we find. But as from today, we are going to focus on the science of accountancy. So we are going to look at financial accounting in particular, where it comes from, where it is going, what, what is required of us, everything about accounting and accountancy as a science. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, some of you may have had accounting at school, but you must all please remember that uh, not all of the students had accounting at school. So therefore, we really have to start at the beginning almost the genesis, as they say. So we're going to start with the very basics of accounting. And then obviously we are going to progress very swiftly. Uh, so um, you must, those of you who had accounting must just bear with us for, for a couple of weeks, because like I say, we have to start right from the beginning. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've just written something on the whiteboard there, order or chaos. So if you can type in the chat for me, what do you prefer in your life from, from the perspective of society, right? We're not talking of counting yet from the perspective of society. You prefer order. Thank you all very much. You don't want to live in a chaotic society, right? You prefer order. Thank you so much. I've got dozens and dozens there and you all agree you would prefer an orderly society. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to ask you next, what determines the order in society? What, what set of rules determines order in society? Or where to? I think you were first with the order as well. Yes, the laws and ethics, right? Ethics in general, ethics. Uh, Quite correct, Keegan, the law, all the various laws, disciplines, yes, ethics, morals, those are all good answers. But the one I respect as well, morals, but the one like I've well also says there, and Caitlin, the laws, right? The laws that govern society. Now, ladies and gentlemen, who, who determines the laws of society? Who passes or promulgates laws? There is a specific body. Very good try, Keegan. The government is one of the parties that does that. Tepiso, you as well. Government is one of those parties. Yes, yes, Izili. Government is one of those parties, but but there are there are many parties involved. Not only one, not only the governing party can determine laws because the law, there we go. A kolile, you've got a parliament, ladies and gentlemen, parliament. That is where the governing party and all other parties congregate. Uh, the, it's normally the government that, that proposes a new law, a new act of parliament, as we call it. That is why it is called an act of parliament. In fact, those laws are acts of parliament. And then they debate it and they, 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 uh, uh, grind it out, you know, and they discuss it, and eventually a new law or a new act of parliament comes into being, right? And that new act then regulates some area of our society so that everything is done in an orderly fashion, that we don't have chaos. Now, a similar kind of thing happens with accounting, ladies and gentlemen. The only difference is that, or the big difference is that in the case of laws of, or acts of parliament, they are created for a specific country or a specific domain. So South Africa has got its parliament and the acts that they pass there or promulgate as they call the fancy word in parliament, that applies to this country as such. 
and only this country. England, for instance, they have got their own Houses of Parliament. The acts they pass there will only be applicable in that country. And the same with any other country. But now when it comes to accounting, we know, especially for the last four or five decades, that trading has become a global activity. We don't only trade with our next, our next door tribe or our next door neighbor or our next town or the next province or the neighboring country. We are trading all over the world, right? We've even now seen what impact the Russian uh, uh, war against Ukraine has on South Africa, which is very, very distant from there. It can have an effect on our diesel supplies. It can have an effect on our even our bread prices, right? So we are living almost, as they say, in a global village. So when it comes to accounting, accounting also has to take place on a global stage, ladies and gentlemen, on a global stage. Uh, by the way, I haven't got the register. Miss um, uh, uh, Morris normally does that, but I've set the blackboard collaborate to automatically take uh, um, take a register. So it has been set for automatic uh, automatic register, which means that if you if you are uh, not later than 15 minutes, uh, then it, it it marks you present. Um, if you're if you are uh, more than 15 minutes late, it marks you uh, uh, late. And if you're more than 30 minutes late, it marks you absent. <laughs> OK, so it has been set. Thank you so much. Um, Inga, yes, you've got your hand up. Um, good morning, sir. Good morning, Inga. Um, I hope you I, I hope you're doing well. So can I ask, is this group for all groups? Yes, yes, this this all all our classes are for all class groups and all offerings, ladies and gentlemen. I think I mentioned that perhaps last week, uh, right at the beginning of class, I said we employ a very, very new technique, which is called team teaching, right? So each and every class is for all the class groups and all the offerings. So if you are mainstream, if you are, whether you are in group A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, whatever, this is your class. If you are an ECP student, this is your class. If you're a Wellington student, this is your class. Okay, so it is for everyone, Inga. Thanks for bringing that up. Thanks for raising that. This must be clear, students. It's for everyone. Mbuyelo, you've got your hand up. You must just uh, unmute your microphone if you want to speak. Maybe that was by accident. Okay, it's taken down now. Okay, ladies and gents, so when it comes to this global village, we also have to have rules when it comes to accounting. And there must also be a body that provides us with those rules. And those rules in general are called the International Financial Accounting Standards, right? So they are not laws, they are called standards. And the body that produces that is the International Accounting Standards Board. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I just want to show you a few things. Our main part of our discussion, our initial discussion is going to be about the IASB or International Accounting Standards Board and IFRSs. But our main topic is going to be uh, the conceptual framework because that is where it starts. So I just want to show you initially where you can find the conceptual framework. So I'm just going to go to our, our Blackboard website. If you will just excuse me, uh, there we go to our Blackboard website. Just waiting for it to appear. Okay, so there's our Blackboard website. So you can find the conceptual framework in two spots. The first spot is under Content General. So if you use that menu item, Content General, you will see if you go down a little bit, there we have the conceptual framework for financial reporting. 
the full version. So there you can access it, you can download it, you can read it, whatever you want to do there. Right. Uh, let me just briefly go to the chat. Oh, uh, Muyelo says your mic is not working. Please share link for this class. There are many students who are in the wrong group. I was there too. Oh, didn't realize there was another group. Let me just, um, okay. Um, let me just go and find the link for you. Um, I'll do that in a second uh, because I'll have to go out of this site. And the second place that you can find it, ladies and gents, I'll, I'll post the link just now. Uh, the second place is under content per topic. So if we go to content per topic, uh, then we go down to this one. We've already done the introduction and theoretical concepts last week and the week before. Uh, so now you go to overview of the conceptual framework and IFRSs. Right, there's our learning outcomes and you'll see right at the top there, there's something called conceptual framework for financial reporting. That is the same document. Okay, let me just go back to the chat. Um, has somebody posted the link there or must I still do that? Let me just see. It doesn't look like it. Okay, let me then just go and find the link for us. Um, I sent an email yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, to all of you, to all students, right? So if you look amongst your emails, uh, you would also find that the guest link I just renamed it. I called it, uh, I simply called it Enter Classroom, okay? Ah, oh, there's somebody has posted it. Let me just see if it's the same as mine. <laughs> it should obviously be. Um, it should be this one, ladies and gentlemen, this one at the bottom here, the one that I've posted. So it, it comes from yesterday's email, right? The one that was sent out yesterday evening, not last week or any prior week, the one that was sent out yesterday. So that is the one there, right? Have you all got that? Okay, so that is the link that you can forward to other students, but all students from any offering and any campus and any class group would have received the email last last evening as well. We all we said that at the beginning two weeks ago, we said we're going to send that link uh, on the afternoon or evening before the day that the class takes place. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so let me now just show you briefly what that conceptual framework looks like. So this is what it looks like, and then we're going to talk about it. Just waiting for it to appear. So there we are. So that is what the conceptual framework looks like. Let me maybe just zoom in a bit. That's the first page. Uh, we're, not, we're not going to read through it. You can go through it in your own time. I've written some notes that we are going to be discussing during this class, and I'll also make those notes available after the class together with the recording, right? So as you can see, the title of this document is the Conceptual Framework for Financial Reporting. And then it has got a subtitle there or a description. Conceptual Framework for Financial Reporting was uh, initially issued by the International Accounting Standards Board in September 2010, and it was revised in March 2018. And this is quite important for us, not necessarily the, the date itself, but the fact that it was revised in 2018. So you may find that some of you who had accounting at school might have been using the old conceptual framework, the 2010 version. We have to use the latest version, the 2018 version, and that is the one that we have posted here. And that is the one that we are going to be discussing. So let us just look at the table of contents. 
the table of contents, ladies and gentlemen, and then we're going to move away from this and we're going to look at the notes there. So here we have uh, chapter one, the objective of general purpose financial reporting, which we'll discuss in a few minutes time. Chapter two deals with qualitative characteristics of useful financial information. It's quite a mouthful, but we will discuss that thoroughly. Uh, chapter three deals with financial statements and the reporting entity. Chapter four, uh, four is probably the most important chapter for us, so make a note of that. That is something that we will have to discuss very thoroughly and something that you will have to understand very clearly. The elements of financial statements. So we're going to talk about that. In chapter five, we are going to look at recognition and derecognition. In chapter six, we're going to, and this is all chapters of the conceptual framework. We're going to look at measurement. How do we measure the elements in the financial statements? And then chapter seven, we are going to look at presentation and disclosure. So how must the financial information be presented and what must be disclosed? Right, so there's quite a lot of things that we have to talk about. Chapter eight, we can leave out at this point in time, concepts of capital and capital maintenance because that we do in financial accounting three. So at this stage, we're not, we, we might briefly just talk about that, but we're not going to study that yet. So we are going to be looking at the first seven chapters. Okay, let me just stop uh, that. Let me go back to the chat. I heard quite a few pings there. Let me see if there are any questions. Uh, Zikona, where can I find the textbook? Uh, you can, you can, oh, so there, there are so many suppliers on campus. There's the, there's the, uh, uh Skype bookstore, uh, on, on, on the district six campus. They also come around with a, with a, with a van with books to the Wellington campus. So you can find it at Van Skype. You can also order it from various suppliers. You can order it for instance, from, uh, takealot.com. Uh, and so forth. So, so you can just Google it and then, then you will find a supplier. The, the convenience of takealot.com obviously is that they deliver it to your door. Uh, Ticano, I have to cut class a little bit of load shedding. Yes, I've also got load shedding, but fortunately a little bit later. I am recording this session. I will post the recording on Blackboard so you can always catch up afterwards. Um, Okay, you've all got the link now. Uh, is there a textbook of IFRS? Uh, yes, there is, there is, but remember, uh, we, we are just going to do the basics of accounting this year. The textbook on IFRS is called Gripping Garp, and that is prescribed as from your second year. So as from your second year in financial accounting two and financial accounting three, and in fact, if you are doing the advanced diploma, then you'll have two subjects. Uh, th then they split the financial accounting into general financial reporting and specific financial reporting for each of them four. Uh, and then you'll still be using Gripping Garp. So Gripping Garp is the textbook on IFRS, but that is only prescribed as from next year, right? From your second year of study. Uh, are we going to write a test this term? Carla, because we started three weeks later than the other levels, so all the second and third and fourth year level students started three weeks earlier, they are writing this coming week, but we are only going to be writing our tests, our assessments after the, after the break, so in the second term, right? So all the first year subjects are going to uh, do it in the second term, write their tests. Can I use the seventh edition? Yes. Uh, you can use the seventh edition, but then you must just take notes, especially on the conceptual framework. We have page references for the seventh as well as eighth edition in the in the work program, which is part of your subject guide. Uh, but remember the seventh edition, chapter eight, which deals with the conceptual framework, still deals with the old 2010 conceptual framework, right? Now you must use the new one. So when it comes to chapter eight, that's the only one where it's going to affect you. No other chapter is going to affect you, right? It's only chapter eight, the one that deals with the conceptual framework. 
So if you are using the seventh edition, you must just then keep take some notes as we discuss it today. The name of the textbook, you can find it in the subject guide summer. It's called Fundamental Accounting. Fundamental Accounting. Ladies and gents, well, we, 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 um, we've got so much to discuss. Uh, I, I think I've, I've, I've addressed all those queries now. So now let's go and have a look at a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, the one that is recommended, Odidi, is the eighth edition. This, that is the most recent one, the eighth edition. Okay, so now let's just, uh, we're just going to do a little bit of a, of a history lesson uh, just to, 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 to bring together the IFRS and the, and the uh, uh, conceptual framework and the IASB for that matter so that we all uh, just, just see how they, they interlink with one another. So I'll load this document. It's just a one-page document uh, which gives us a brief history of the IFRSs and the conceptual framework. So ladies and gentlemen, what are the IFRSs? Obviously, as you can see, it stands for the International Financial Reporting Standards. They are principles. They are principles that are applied by accountants and academics for that matter. When they record transactions, you remember uh, I spoke about the three sort of legs on which the science of accountancy stand. So record transactions and other financial information or events even, that is what we call the so-called bookkeeping part of accounting. Also to prepare financial statements for external users. And we'll have a look later on what is meant by external users. From next year, you'll have a, 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 a subject called cost accounting, cost and management accounting. They draw up various kinds of statements for internal users, for the managers of the business uh, or the owners of the business and so forth. But for when it comes to financial accounting, we prepare financial statements for external parties, users outside of that particular entity. Here we also, uh, I've just written there, uh, the IFRSs are issued by the International Acting Standards Board. I think I've mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there's a long story behind that. Uh, initially, the, the, the council or the committee that issued the IFR or, or the, the, the standards was called the IASC, the uh, International Accounting Standards Committee. They issued 41 IASs, International Accounting Standards, right? As I see, as I state there, those standards that were developed has got the prefix IAS. So we've got IAS 1 to IAS 41, uh, and the IAS stands for International Accounting Standards. Then, for certain legal reasons, the I uh, the IASC was 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 uh, disbanded, and the new body, the IASB was formed and that is the one that is still with us today. Its very first action was to adopt all those IASs. So the IAS 1 to 41 still exist. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Some of them do not apply anymore. Uh, and then when they started issuing new standards, they did not call them IASs anymore. They called them IFRSs, right? So uh, there we can see the initial 41 was called IAS 1 to 41, but only 25 of them are still in use because the others have been replaced by the newly written IFRSs, which then uh, supersedes them, right? And to date, the IASB has developed 70 new standards and they are numbered IFRS 1 to IFRS 17. We are going to look at one or two of those um, IASs during the course of the year, particularly the one that deals with inventories uh, in, in, in a few months' time. Uh, it is called IAS 2, but most of the IASs we will start addressing thoroughly from our second year of study, from Financial Accounting 2. The major document that we are going to be looking at in Financial Accounting 1 is the conceptual framework for financial reporting. Sometimes we just refer to it as the CF, right? So that is the one that is going to be our main focus in finance in the initial part. You know, before we start looking at accounting equations and recording of transactions. So this is just to give us a framework 
of what accounting is about. <laughs> Let me just uh, go to the chat quickly. Uh, the conceptual framework, I think, is in chapter eight, isn't it? Let me just have a look. Um, I'm not sure whether I have that here. Yeah, chapter eight mostly deal uh, deals with the conceptual framework. Okay, so um, where were we? So the conceptual framework, ladies and gentlemen, is not regarded as the standard itself. It is regarded as the foundation on which all of the other standards are built. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes' time, right? Uh, originally, it was published already in 1989, and then uh, in 2010, there was what they, what they referred to as a, a harmonization project between all the stakeholders all over the world. And that uh, and uh, that produced the 2010 version, but like we said earlier, the 2018 version is the one that we are using now. And ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who, who, who had accounting at school and possibly used the older version of the conceptual framework, the, uh, these are the most significant changes between the 2010 version and the 2018 version. When we are going to look at the, the, the elements, you, you remember one of the chapters deals with the elements of financial statements, we'll see that the, they, they provide us with definitions. Now, the definitions of those elements, which we'll see later on, uh, there are five, assets, liabilities, income, expense, and equity. Uh, the definitions are, are, are a bit different. They have been defined a little bit differently in the latest version. Also, the recognition criteria, which we'll talk about later, has also been slightly amended, right? And then there's improved guidance on measurement and recognition, as well as derecognition and presentation and disclosure, right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that, that is a brief history. So I'm just going to stop sharing this one. Uh, I can close that one now. Let me just go to the chat. Uh, we've got today we've got an automatic attendance register, so it picks up your 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 details from from Blackboard Collaborate, right? Uh, you can you can watch the recording. We've spoken about that earlier. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, let let me just maybe pause there for a for a second. Have you got any questions? This is now a good time to ask. Doesn't seem so. Okay, then we can carry on. This is the second document. This is a bit of a longer one. I think it's about 14. Thank you so much, Enrique. Thank you. Uh, sir, can I have a... Yes, okay. Um, um, I see that we have more than 255 students. That is a problem, Deniswa. Um, it Collaborate can accommodate more than 250, but then I have to change the settings and then you cannot, then, then the, the, the chat facility disappears, students cannot raise their hands, students cannot ask questions. But I guess uh, from next week, I will have to do that. Okay. Uh, Perhaps some students will, will disappear a little bit later, so maybe you can try and rejoin uh, uh, some, some, some time later. But anyway, the recording will be posted to Blackboard. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're just over 250. You, you, you understand, students, if I set it to large group, more than 250, we lose the functionality of chat. And, and, and uh, the fact remains that you can't ask questions either. Right. So if necessary, I will I will change it to, 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 to large groups as from next week. Okay, so let's 
now focus on the conceptual framework itself right now the first sentence i've written here i just want to explain that a little bit uh, we've already mentioned that the conceptual framework is the foundation on which all of the standards and if we talk about the ifrs's that includes the ias series so the ias series as well as the ifrs series so the, the conceptual framework is the foundation on which those those standards are built. The conceptual framework itself is not regarded as a standard. It is just like the basis on which the standards are situated on, right? Then the next sentence uh, is, there we state that nothing in the conceptual framework overrides any standard or any requirements in a standard. Now, what that really comes down to is the, the conceptual framework is almost like a generic document. It sort of covers everything in accounting, but for specific areas of accounting, subsequent standards have been issued. So there is a standard IAS number one, which deals with the presentation of financial statements. So that then takes preference. It overrides the conceptual framework. For inventories, for instance, there is IAS two, so that overrides anything in the conceptual framework something that we are going to be doing during the course of this year is property plant and equipment and that comes from ias 16 and anything in ias 16 overrides the conceptual framework so the conceptual framework basically if you want to if you want to uh, look at it this way uh, applies everywhere except where there is a standard for so if there is not a specific standard for that specific area on the financial statements, then the conceptual framework applies, right? So this is the over, not overarching, but the, but the foundation of the standard. So if there's not a standard for a specific area, the conceptual framework applies, okay. But if there is a specific standard for a specific area, such as property, plant and equipment, or such as financial assets, or financial liabilities for that matter, or inventories, then that standard takes preference. Right, so what is the conceptual framework? It, it defines itself, which is quite funny. So the conceptual framework states that it is a set of accounting objectives and fundamentals developed by the International Accounting Standards Board to ensure uniformity in interpretation across various accounting methodologies and we can even add there also across various countries across various domains if you wish right so therefore there is uniformity and consistency in the way that accountants let's say in south africa draw up financial statements to the way they do it in botswana or the way they do it in Mozambique or the way they do it in Australia or the way they do it in Germany, right? So we are all using the same set of principles. So that makes it possible for a person who wants to make economic decision, a person, let's say in Britain, to use financial statements from South Africa and be able to understand it, or a person in New Zealand to be able to interpret the financial statements drawn up by an accountant let's say in uh, zimbabwe for that matter okay so that is the whole point there i see you've already answered yourselves there thank you right uh then what is the objective of general purpose financial reporting ladies and gentlemen because they say that the objective of the conceptual framework is to provide general purpose financial reporting and then also explain various concepts that underpin financial reporting so this is quite important for us to know also we can see that there are that they mentioned their three primary users so we'll talk about that uh, soon so the objective of general purpose financial statements is to provide financial information about the reporting entity and that reporting entity can be a sole proprietor as we've mentioned last week it can be a partnership it can be a close corporation 
it can be a company right so whatever the reporting entity is and then quite an important word for us here that is useful to the three primary users of those financial statements so that they can make decisions about providing resources to that entity right so that they can make we can even call them economic economic decisions about whether or not should they should be providing resources in other words capital to that entity and then they provide us with three typical or primary users there, there are other users of the financial statements but these are the three primary users. Firstly, existing and potential investors, right? Existing investors, maybe let's look at the case of a company. I know we're only going to look at companies in financial, as from a financial accounting too. But if you are talking about existing investors in a company, who are we re really referring to? If you could type in the chat for me there, please. Those of you who already know about companies. Shareholders, thank you, Abuswa. Yes, the shareholders are the existing investors in a company. And obviously, thank you also there, Aneswa, shareholders. Yes, correct. They are also always, always, especially in the case of listed companies, uh, there, there, uh, some kind of see where as, as, as preempted what I wanted to say now. There are always other people who might be interested in becoming shareholders, right? They can see this company is growing exponentially. This company is becoming larger. It's becoming more profitable. I want a piece of this, right? So they would want to invest in that company. So there are two things that we've got to think about here. First of all, they have to take financial decisions right so where will they get this information that tells them where do they get the information that tells them that this company is expanding and growing and becoming more profitable from the what the things that we produce well not 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 well they, they can be listed on the jse yes but from the financial statements or the or the annual report as Sivangile also says for the financial reports right that is where they get the information from so if we do not provide as accountants those particular kinds of information then we are basically useless that that means that the financial the the the, the, the information is not useful okay so existing and potential investors uh, so that in the case of a company could be your current shareholders as well as people or, or, or other other businesses who want to become shareholders in the company. Also existing and potential lenders, ladies and gentlemen. So in other words, if the company wants to borrow money from, an, from a financial institution or, or any business entity for that matter, even if it's a sole trader, what is the first thing that that financial institution like a bank what is the first thing that they are going to require from that entity whether it's a sole trader or a partnership or a cc or a company what what are they going to require before they lend money before they lend money before they make a loan to the company what are they going to require what must they produce they're fine well not necessarily the records the 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 books of account are actually uh, confidential, but the financial statements, that is public, right? The financial statements, the bank statement they can get for themselves, but the financial statements, again, the financial statements, that is what the accountants draw up. That is our product as financial accountants, right? So before they are going to grant us a loan, they are going to say, Give me your financial statements. I want to judge whether you will be able to repay the loan. If you won't be able to, oh, and they can even check whether you are blacklisted. In other words, if you have got a poor credit record, right? Their credit score, I think they, they very often talk about the credit score nowadays, right? So existing lenders are people who have already loaned money to the company. The company has already borrowed money from them, from 
time to time, and this will normally happen on an annual basis, they will want the financial statements to see whether the money that they have loaned to that entity is still safe. And then potential lenders, ladies and gentlemen, that should be obvious. That is mm, a sir, sir. Yes. Um, yes. In that case, in that case, um, I think they they may be wanting to to see if the business is also solvent. Absolutely. I'm so glad you came up with that. Right. That is quite an advanced uh, 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 term already. We, we are going to address that at, a, at, at some point in time today. So what does it mean if that entity is solvent? It means it is not bankrupt, right? That they can see. Thank you so much for that contribution. I appreciate that. So that means, thank you, you know, thank you. A business is bankrupt if they owe more than they own, right? If their assets has got a lower value than what they what what their liabilities are we are going to talk about these these elements later on it means that business is bankrupt and it will be crazy for any lender to then borrow money to the or lend money to them right you would agree with that because clearly they won't be able to repay the money even if the if if that business is liquidated they won't be able to repay all their debts right Okay, thank you for that. That is a very good point. So they want to see that the company is solvent. Also, uh, solvency or where to uh, solvency is actually that they can pay their long-term liabilities, right? Uh, the one where they can pay their short-term liabilities is called liquidity, right? So if the company is liquid, yes, there we go, Caleb. Thank you. So both of you, thank you for those contributions. Liquidity normally means the company has got sufficient short-term funds to pay their, their, their expenses and their, their, their debts as they come up, you know, their, their creditors at the end of the month and so forth. You're welcome, always. to Thank you for the contribution, though. That is very good. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, whereas solvency is in the longer term. Uh, can they pay their loans over the next, let's say it's a long-term loan over five years, can they service that? Uh, Inga, you had a hand up, or, or, or uh, are you done? Um, sir, I wanted to ask that whenever we, as a business, apply for a loan, does the do the creditors always want the financial position statement? They would. They will definitely want the statement of financial position. In fact, they will want the whole set of financial statements. Uh, the reason for even, that is, yes. Even the income statement. Yes, yes, because each statement gives them gives them gives them a different picture. Uh, we'll see later on when we go through the conceptual framework. Your statement of comprehensive income, or uh, I think you can also we'll talk about what the names are, or your statement of profit or loss. That gives that gives them an an indication of the performance of the company right that is also the term used in the conceptual framework so it gives them an, a, a clear picture of the performance of the company in other words is it profitable or not right the statement of financial position on the other hand gives them a picture a snapshot picture on a specific day of the company's uh, solvency as you've already mentioned as well as the company's liquidity that is why we have to split all assets into non-current assets and current assets. That is something we're going to be discussing, probably not today, but, but when we get to, to, to uh, a property, plant and equipment. As well as your liabilities, you have to distinguish between current and non-current liabilities, right? So that it can clearly indicate whether the company is liquid, but also whether the company is solvent, right? And then they also want another statement. Now, this statement we're only going to be doing in financial accounting too, not this year yet, is the statement of cash flows. There, that presents another picture. That presents the picture of how much cash the company has generated. And cash generated is not necessarily the same as profits made, right? We'll talk about the accrual principle a little bit later today, hopefully. Then we'll see it's not exactly necessarily the same thing. So your statement of cash flows uh, uh, gives a picture of how cash was generated and how cash was spent as well, right? 
So, so before any uh, potential investor or any potential lender will, will, will uh, provide financing or resources to this entity, they will want that full set of financial statements, Inga. So not only one statement, they will want the full picture. And then also existing and potential creditors, ladies and gentlemen. Also how it was invested, that will be part of your statement of financial position, how you invested your, 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 your resources, right? Uh, Nintendo creditors are people who lend the business the capital needed and therefore uh, debenture holders, right? And uh, now, not in this particular case, uh, uh, Nintendo, uh, I'll talk about creditors now. Debenture holders are also lenders, right? A debenture is a loan instrument. It is a long-term loan instrument. Uh, uh, I don't want to, we, we can discuss it, but it is it is like, a, like an IOU. So in the case of debentures, that is still uh, part of the loan capital, yes. Loan capital, that not own capital, like share capital. Loan capital that the company can acquire from lenders. But now it's not an institutional lender. It's many different lenders because you are issuing various debentures to various debenture holders. In the case of creditors, we are mostly referring to trade creditors. The supplier of your inventory, for instance, or the supplier of services, services such as uh, uh, water and electricity services or telephone services or internet services. So those creditors, uh, the, the, the existing creditors would be those people who've already granted you uh, 90 days to pay, right? So you open an account with, say, Edgar's, if, if you're, a, you're, a, you're a, a consumer, and then they give you, I think, something like six months to pay, that means they have granted you credit. Uh, external auditors, um, external auditors, remember, uh, accountants can also be external auditors. So external auditors, what they do, and I've practiced as one for uh, 24 years, um, they examine the financial statements that have been drawn up by financial accountants, right? They examine them and then they do certain auditing procedures. They go through them. They verify that the facts in the financial statements are correct. And then afterwards, and this is a very long, long story there, Inati gets to the end of my story. And then they provide an opinion whether the financial statements, in fact, are a true or a fair presentation of the company's financial position and the company's performance and the company's cash flows, right? So the external auditors are a completely independent firm who examines the, the financial statements. They do all their tests and procedures, uh, and then they, they, they express an opinion thereon. Lungani, yes. Yes, sir. sir. Sorry, sir. Uh, may I ask this question, sir? Is there a difference between a prof professional accountant and a, a, an external auditor, sir? Yes, there is. Uh, the designation professional accountant, the designation professional accountant means that you are a member of a professional body, right? A professional accounting body. Uh, there, are, there are quite a number. In South Africa, the three most popular ones are the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants or SICA. The South African Institute of Professional Accountants, it's actually called that, or SIPA. There's also a South African, a Southern African Institute of Business Accountants. Yeah. So SICA, SIPA, and SIPA are the most popular ones. Most of our students tend to prefer SIPA. They also uh, obviously uh, endorse our course. To be, uh, what was the question again? If there's a difference between a professional and accountant and an auditor, was it that? An auditor? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Okay. Now, to be an external auditor, now you get internal auditors and you get external auditors, ladies and gentlemen. You learn all about that in your second year. You've actually got a, 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 a subject called internal auditing too. Anyway, internal auditing, uh, 
the, 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 the internal auditor is actually part of the entity. They, they are employed by the entity and they look after the controls of that entity. The external auditor, on the other hand, uh, is from an independent firm. It cannot be employed by that entity that it audits. Uh, and then they provide the independent opinion. Now, to be an uh, internal auditor, uh, you, you can join the IIA, the Institute of Internal Auditors, uh, but you, you do not need to be a member to be a, a, an internal auditor, but it is certainly highly recommended because then you've got a career path. In the case of an external auditor, you've got to be part of the, uh, um, what is that body called now? Um, I forget the name because it changed recently. Uh, yes, you, you have to be a, a, a chartered accountant amongst others, but, but then besides being a member of SICA, you've also got a IRBA, the IRBA, finally it dawned on me, the IRBA, I-R-B-A, the Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors. So if you want to be an external auditor, also sometimes referred to as a registered auditor. Say, please repeat you, that one. Uh, you, then you've also got to be a member of the IRBA. IRBA, we often just call it IRBA. IRBA. And that stands not for interna <coughs> international in this case, that stands for the independent. Independent regulatory board. Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors. With a diploma in accountancy, how many years would it take to actually be a CA and can one be an external auditor with a diploma in accountancy? Uh, that is a long story. Uh, Asanda, I'm, I'm now saying this tongue in cheek, I'm just joking. You, you mean if you do not fail anything, how many years? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Obviously, you are all going to pass everything every year. Okay. Uh, it, it, is a long, it is a long path. It is a, as long a path as a medical doctor. How long does it take for a medical doctor? At least seven to eight years. Right. It is the same with becoming a chartered accountant. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, once you've done the, the diploma in accountancy, that is, that is only three years. So you're not even halfway through, okay? Not even halfway through. Then you've got to do the advanced diploma, right? The advanced diploma. That is your fourth year. Then the year thereafter, you can choose, you can either do the, the uh, postgraduate diploma uh, at CPUT, or you can go to one of the other universities like UNISA or UWC or, or, or UCT. They present a, a, an honors degree in accountancy, right? So, so they are at the same level. So you either can do the uh, PG DIP, the postgraduate diploma, or an honors degree. Then, ladies and gentlemen, whether you've got a BCom or a B accounting or an, uh, at other universities, or whether you've got these diplomas, then there's another year that you've got to study, right? That's, they, they call it the conversion course, the conversion course. Unfortunately, we do not present that. And then, ladies and gentlemen, there's another year that all of, all of you, it doesn't matter where you have studied, you still got to do. And that is the CTA, a CTA qualification. CTA stands for the Certificate in the Theory of Accountancy. And only once you've passed that CTA, and I can tell you that is the hardest thing I've passed in my life, because you've got about uh, how many subjects? You've got about eight subjects, and you have to pass all of them at the same sitting. If you fail one subject, you've got to write all eight of them the next year. <laughs> okay. So until you pass all of those subjects in the CTA at the same sitting, the same, same year, then only do you, you get the CTA, right? Some universities run the CTA concurrently with an honors degree, but only once you've done all of that, Thank then you much. can actually write the psycho exams. 
A psycho certificate, it's not really a certificate, it is a designation or a membership, right? So once you've got the CTA, then you are allowed to go and write the psycho uh, entrance exams, right? And once you've written the exams and you've passed the psycho exams, then you get the designation, Chartered Accountant SA, right? Which means you have now become a full member of the Institute uh, of, of Chartered Accountants, the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. So it's a long path, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but but remember they are, that that is not the only career path, right? There are also career paths that you can you can start after doing the diploma itself, uh, such as for instance assistant accountants and trainee accountants, uh, or you can do the, the 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 advanced diploma. And once you've done the advanced diploma, you can already become a member of some of the the professional bodies, right? And then you can be quite a senior accountant. And obviously, with experience, you, you can become the, the, the chief accountant and the chief financial officer even, right? So, so the possibilities are endless. It, it all depends on, on your ambitions and your hard work, right? Is there maths? Uh, is there maths in what? We haven't got maths specifically in the course, but, but your statistics for accountants uh, will contain a lot of maths. But there's no there's there's no math as such uh, uh, in any of those those uh, entrance exams. No, it's mostly about financial accounting, about auditing, about tax law, uh, uh, about uh, commercial law, and so forth. Yes, the BCom in accounting is is uh, equivalent is equivalent to our advanced diploma. So they are on the same level. The trainee path, we're going to talk a lot about that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, also, tax analyst, we're going to talk a lot of those career paths in the future. Don't worry, you are you are still spring chickens here. <laughs> so during the course of the year, we're going to have all sorts of meetings with you, uh, between you and the professional bodies next year as well. So we are going to provide you with all sorts of guidance on career paths, right? Uh, today we are a bit we are a bit tight for time, so I don't think we we because that is our whole two hour discussion on its own, right? Tax analyst, yes, we specialize in becoming tax analysts. We've we've got a postgraduate diploma specifically in taxation, where you can become a tax consultant or a tax analyst and so forth. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, enough of that now. <laughs> Let us proceed with our document. Uh, so so we've we've covered those. The, those typical primary users, right? So the existing and potential predators, rather those people will provide you with an account that you can pay in 30 days time or 60 days time or 90 days time or even six months time, right? Uh, so they also want to see your financial statements. They don't want to provide you with merchandise and at the end of the day, you can't pay for it, right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, other uses of the financial state, there, there are many, too many to mention. Very often, the, the employees of the company themselves will want to see, will want to have a look at the financial statements to see, am I working for a solid company? Is this company not going to be going bust and then I've got no work? And then there's another user, a little bit of a negative, ladies and gentlemen. Who else do you think wants to use the financial statements in a, a, a less pleasant way? to base your tax assessment on the financial statements that you are going to be supplying, right? So the South African Revenue Service or whichever revenue service you are, uh, 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 that, that you are trading in their domain, they will want the financial statements. Yes, trade unions, that's another, that's another uh, potential user. Competition is another potential user. SARS is definitely a, a, a definite user of the financial statements. Okay, ladies and gents, um, yes, SARS, South African Revenue Service or any other revenue service. So let us carry on, ladies and gents. 
Um, I've already mentioned some of the changes, so we're not going to look at that again. This we can just uh, basically look at. This comes from, uh, 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 I can just, this is just a reference for myself. I can delete that. Uh, the conceptual framework is basically a tool that has three purposes. It helps the IASB to develop the other standards, right? They also help those preparers of financial statements who may need to create their own accounting policies. Now, now this is not a usual situation. Usually, we have got some standards that, that cover all situations, but once in a while, if you are a bit unlucky, <laughs> You may find a situation in practice where it is not covered by any standard and then the conceptual framework helps us in developing an accounting policy for that area. So once in a while, you'll, you'll find a totally new kind of business. You know, we very recently Bitcoin, the, the, the cryptocurrencies came into existence. It's not something that's been with us for years. It, it hasn't been there 10 or 20 years ago. So new accounting policies had to be designed to cater for, for companies who issue cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin, right? So that is another uh, uh, purpose of the conceptual framework. And it also helps all parties, accountants and auditors and any user of the financial statements to properly understand and interpret the, uh, the, 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 the standards themselves, the IAS series as well as the IFRS series. We are going to look at those concepts later on. We've already seen those concepts that are that are currently contained in the CF. Those are the chapters that we've mentioned earlier, right? So it's chapter one and chapter two, three, four, and so forth. We are going to look at the first seven uh, chapters and then uh, capital and capital maintenance. We'll look at in uh, uh, another in another academic year. Now, when it comes to the qualitative characteristics, now we've already looked at the objectives. Those are the objectives or purposes. The uh, qualitative characteristics of useful information, that is now chapter number two of the conceptual framework. Uh, I've, I've made a little diagram here just to, 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 to separate them. They basically distinguish between two kinds of qualitative characteristics. In other words, what kind of qualities must the financial statements have to actually be useful to those primary users of the financial statement. First of all, they distinguish uh, between fundamental, fundamental qualitative characteristics and enhancing qualitative characteristics, right? Fundamental qualitative characteristics and enhancing qualitative characteristics. So what is the difference between the two? They say the fundamental qualitative characteristics are absolutely essential. That is the key word. It is essential for those financial statements to be useful. So if, if the financial statements do not comply with the fundamental qualitative characteristics, they are useless. In other words, those primary users of the financial statements cannot use them to make their economic decisions, right? On the other hand, the enhancing qualitative characteristics, what, what are their roles? Their role is to take already useful financial statements and make it even more useful, right? So those characteristics improve the usefulness of the financial statements. What are those qualitative characteristics, ladies and gentlemen? We'll, we'll, we'll discuss each of them in, in, a, in a few minutes time. Uh, the fundamental qualitative characteristics, there are two of them, namely relevance. Relevance, in other words, the information in the financial statements must be relevant and it must be a faithful representation, a faithful representation of what happened in that that entity right the enhancing qualitative characteristics are comparability we'll talk about comparability in a few minutes time verifiability we'll talk about verifiability soon as well timeliness timeliness so it must be produced in as early and as soon as possible 
also understandability, right? So we're going to talk about all of them. Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's let's start talking about them. Uh, let's uh, start looking at each of them individually. So the fundamental qualitative characteristics that are essential for the financial information to be useful, like we said, is relevance, right? Relevance. So what they are saying, in order for, relevant, for, for, for information to be relevant, we must consider as accountants whether it could make a difference in users' decision making. If we omit, if we omit the information, is it going to make a difference to the decision that the users make? Or if we incorrectly state it, right, will it make a difference? If it will make a difference, then it is relevant. If the omission thereof, or the misstatement even, if that will make no difference to the decision that the, the, the user of the financial statements will take, then it means that information is actually irrelevant. Okay. Faithful representation, ladies and gentlemen, we can talk about the term substance over form next year. In financial accounting too, we are going to revisit this, this conceptual framework in the first couple of weeks. Then we're going to go a little bit deeper. Then you've got a better understanding of financial accounting, and then we'll talk about substance over form. But this is the important one for us now at this stage. They are saying, a, what does it mean if the financial statements are a faithful representation of what happened in the company? Basically, it comes down to three aspects, three criteria, if you wish. So in order to achieve faithful representation, the financial information given to the users in the financial statements must be complete. In other words, nothing of importance must be omitted or left out. Secondly, it must be neutral. So there must be no bias in it. You know, you are not overstating your assets to get a loan, or you're not understating your liabilities to get credit. It must be neutral, and it must be free from error, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Okay, so in order to be a faithful representation, I'm sorry, in summary, the financial information in your financial statements must be complete, neutral, and free from error. Right. Uh, now you can you can ask what what is meant by relevance? Now relevance, there there are many ways in 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 which you can look at it, but at the end of the day, it really means that it is going to affect the decisions of those users of the financial statements. So they are saying basically that to be relevant to the users, that information must either have predictive value or confirmatory value or both right now what does that mean what can you perhaps think of any kind of thing that has predictive value well ladies and gentlemen if you look at your 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 statement of comprehensive income if the company had revenue from sales of two million rands this year right and they had revenue from sales of 1.9 million rands the previous year and those were reported in the financial statements you can probably confidently predict that this new year they're going to have revenue from sales of plus minus 2,1 million rands, right? So it has predictive value. If the company had purchases, let's say, for instance, of 1 million rands this year and 900,000 rands last year, you can, with, with great confidence, predict that in the next year it is probably going to have more or less purchases of 1.1 million, right? Because that seems to be the trend. That is what they mean by predictive value. So the, the users of the financial statements can use the information to analyze the trends there. Confirmatory, confirmatory value, that is the more obvious one. That simply confirms what was the sales during that particular financial year according to the sales journal or according to the, the, the financial accounting records, or what was the purchases for that particular year. And preferably, that kind of figure will have both a predictive and confirmatory value. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, then we have the concept of materiality, the concept of materiality, which influences relevance. So what, what materiality is, and perhaps uh, I think we do have a, a, a definition somewhere here, can't remember where, but anyway, uh, materiality, what does it mean? It means an item is material, right, if it's omission its omission if it has been accidentally left out or its misstatement in other words it has been included but it has been included at the wrong value if that will influence the economic decision made by the users of the financial statements or the financial information right so ladies and gentlemen uh, if i can ask you a very simple little question let's say this this company or this this entity if you wish uh, you can just type a little bit of a, a answer for me let's say this this entity has got sales of two and a half million rands right they've got sales of two and a half million rands but they've actually misstated it slightly they've misstated it by five rands it should have been two million five hundred thousand and five rands do you think that will change the economic decision of the users, that five rand difference? Yes or no? Okay, we have a difference of opinion here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we have a difference of opinion, which is your right. But the answer is actually no, it won't. If I look at the financial statement as a user and I see that they've got one and a, one and a, what did I say, two and a half million rands worth of revenue from sales, then I'm pretty pleased. And whether it's five rand more or five rand less, I'm still going to be pretty pleased with that two and a half million, right? Or more or less two and a half million. Thank you, Inati. Yes. So that five rands difference is not going to make uh, any impact on whatever i decide whether i'm going to decide to invest in this company or not so that we refer to as an immaterial immaterial difference right we're going to we're going to use this concept a lot going forward especially from financial accounting too and especially in auditing however ladies and gentlemen let's say they've they've left out accidentally three hundred thousand rands worth of of of, of um, of, of sales right so they have stated their sales as 2.5 million but it is actually 2.8 million do you think that difference is going to make a, dis, uh, a difference to my decision if i see 2.8 million a uh, 2.5 million yes in this case it will if i see 2.5 million i see mm, that is impressive but not impressive enough the competitor did better but if i see 2.8 million I see, oh, now they've done better than the competitor. Maybe this is the company I must invest in. Yes, exactly the Anezwa as well. It is a significant amount, right? So materiality comes, come, comes down, like Anezwa says, to how significant it is. In financial accounting too, when we go deeper into this concept, we'll see that it's not always just about the amount. It's also about the nature of the item. Uh, but the fact is, that uh, if it if is significant enough that it will change the economic decisions of the users of the financial statements, then that is referred to as material. And if it is material, it automatically is relevant. Okay, ladies and gents, um, where were we? Uh, materiality. Then what about faithful representation, ladies and gentlemen? Faithful representation basically means that whatever uh, is presented in the financial statements must reflect the substance, the substance of the event that took place, right? So if you, for instance, classify something as revenue from sales, it must actually be from revenue from sales. Or if you classify something like dividend, dividend income, it must be because you received income from dividends from your investment in the shares of another company. 
or if you state uh, 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 salaries and wages, for instance, expense 5 million rands, right? That must not represent purchases. It must not represent anything other than salaries and wages. So to be a faithful representation means it must faithfully represent what actually happened, the substance of the event. Now, substance over form, let's skip that for the time being. I've just made a note for myself here. I can delete that. We'll talk about that in financial accounting too, uh, because that, that, that requires some knowledge that you must still gain over the course of this year. Right, and as we've already mentioned, we've, we've, we've said this, uh, for, for, for information to be a faithful representation, it must be complete, neutral, and free from error. And here, what do we mean by complete? It means all necessary information, all relevant information must be provided to the user. Nothing must be left out or omitted, right? And that not only includes values, but also narrative explanations and narrative descriptions, such as revenue from sales or salaries or internet expense, right? So that the user can understand the phenomenon or the, the, the event that is being portrayed in the financial statements. Uh, this is just an example, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this, this doesn't come from the conceptual framework. Uh, so just if the phenomenon is, for instance, an asset, we will have to describe the nature of the asset. In other words, it is a machine, or it is a motor vehicle, or it is land, or it is a building, or whatever it is, right? And then also give relevant numerical information, such as, such as what did it cost us, what is the accumulated depreciation? What is its carrying amount at the end of the year? And all sorts of things. We'll discuss that when we get to the, to get to the specific uh, standards that deal with assets. But just this is just an illustration what we mean by a phenomenon, right? Or if the phenomenon, let's say, was sales, ladies and gentlemen, right? Then we will say it was revenue from sales. We will say that the amount was... Uh, uh, 5 million rands and so forth, right? Okay, there won't be uh, depreciation or, or accumulated depreciation. Uh, when will financial information be neutral? We've also already said that is when it is not biased. So in other words, it is not artificially inflated, right? Very often, you know, this is where fraud comes in. What is fraud? Fraud is a misrepresentation of the facts, right? Fraud is basically when you are presenting things not like they happened <laughs> okay so if this company for instance wants to go for for a new loan they've only got they've only got assets of let's say 500,000 rands but they know the bank is not going to give them a loan if they've only got 500,000 rands worth of assets so they add a little one at the front right so they now present false fraudulent financial statements saying that they've got 1,500,000 rands worth of assets that means the financial statements are now not neutral. They are biased in favor of the entity, right? Uh, neutrality is, is often also affected by what we refer to as prudence. We'll talk about this. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about this now. Prudence basically means that you are very, very careful. Prudence is the exercise of caution when making decisions whether, whether there is a or where there is a level of uncertainty about information. And please make a note about this. I should probably have tucked it in, but I didn't. Uh, prudence basically comes down to this. You are so careful as an accountant that the, if there is any possibility of making a loss, any possibility of making a loss, you recognize that loss ASAP immediately, right? As soon as you can, you recognize that loss. You do not want nasty surprises in the future. So if there's any possibility of a loss, you recognize it. That's where we get things like write-off of inventories, which we'll talk about later in the year. On the other hand, if there's a possibility of making an income or a profit, you do not recognize it until such time as it has been realized, right? 
So you do not recognize it until it really, really, really exists. Okay, so that is what prudence comes down to. Uh, then free from error, ladies and gentlemen, uh, basically means that that uh, uh, there are two aspects to it. If it is a directly measurable item, such as purchases, where you receive a, 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 an invoice, an invoice from your supplier, then obviously it is directly observable and directly measurable. But also, ladies and gentlemen, we often find in financial statements that we have to make certain estimates. Uh, property plant and equipment is a typical example where we have to estimate depreciation. We have to, in, in the process of estimating depreciation, we also have to estimate residual values. We also have to estimate useful lifetimes for those assets. So there's a lot of estimates therein. So is that still free from error? And the answer is yes, ladies and gentlemen. The courts have given this clear indication that as long as you use a logical and scientifically based estimation method, one that is properly based in, 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 in property, plant and equipment, we'll see we get three different bases that are recognized. They are called the straight line method, the diminishing balance method, and the sum of units method. But anyway, that is that will do in a few few months time. Uh, then it is still regarded as free from error, as long as you use a proper base to use to do the estimation, and you must also, by the way, disclose your your basis of of, of decision making. So you must state what method did you use, what were your 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 estimates, and so forth. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to get to. Um, the enhancing qualitative characteristics, it looks like we're not be, going to be able to complete all of this today. Let's just go through this briefly, ladies and gentlemen. Like I say, I'm going to post it on Blackboard, then you can read it and you can always ask questions on that. What is meant by comparability, ladies and gentlemen? There are two aspects to that. There are two aspects to that. Firstly, uh, you must be able to compare one entity with another. So that means the same set of accounting rules must apply to, to, to all those entities that you are comparing one another with. So you must be able to compare one entity with another entity. But also, secondly, you must be able to compare financial information within one specific entity, the same entity, from the one year to the next. Right. So that means the financial statements must be drawn, drawn up on a consistent basis right ladies and gents verifiability means that that it must be possible to verify whether the information that was provided is true accurate and justified now how can you do that ladies and gentlemen as long as the company keep their records they've got invoices and statements from their suppliers they generate their own invoice and all sorts of documentation then it means the information that eventually end up in the financial statement is verifiable, right? We just mentioned here predictions cannot obviously be verified. It's normally just historical information, such as what happened during a specific financial year that can be verified. Uh, verification can be direct or indirect. I've just written a little, a few paragraphs there. Uh, and given a few examples, direct verification is, for instance, if you look at the, the total of your supplier invoices for the year, and that gives you your purchases. Uh, indirect verification is where you can take, let's say, your opening inventory at the beginning of the year, you add your purchases, you deduct the cost of the inventory that you've sold, and that provides you with a theoretical closing inventory. That is what we refer to as the perpetual inventory method. A direct method, a direct observation would be to actually count the inventory at the year end, which businesses do in any case, right? So if you look at inventory at the end of the year, direct verification is to count your inventory and then cost it. Indirect verification is to reconcile your opening inventory and eventually arrive 
at a closing inventory or theoretical closing inventory figure. In other words, you start with the cost of your inventory at the beginning of the year, you add the cost of the inventory that you purchased, you deduct the cost of the inventory that was sent back to the supplier, you deduct the cost of the inventory that you've sold to your customers during the year, and then that gives you a theoretical end of year inventory balance. Timeliness, ladies and gentlemen, very straightforward. Uh, if you are sitting here, what, where are we? We are on the 10th of March, 2022. We're on the 10th of March, 2022. Let's ask, you can type for me in the chat there quickly. If you want to decide, I want to invest in this company or should I not invest in this company or should I lend money to this company or shouldn't I? Will then 2015 financial statements be adequate for you? If they provide you as a lender or a potential lender, no, Keegan, thank you. No, thank you, Seathless. Thank you, everyone. No, that's too old. That's too old. So many things could have happened in the six years since then, right? Thank you. No, not exactly. No, <laughs> that that's that's ancient history, right? That company could have deteriorated tremendously over the last six months exactly Zadili. it is too old right so timeliness means that the financial statements must be published as soon as humanly possible after the end of the financial year thank you all for that answer obviously ladies and gentlemen if your financial year ends on the 31st of december you cannot produce your financial statements on the 1st of january right you've got to do all sorts of financial calculations you've got to do so all sorts of closing entries so it's going to take you a few weeks but at least it should be done within a reasonable period of time so that when 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 uh, this this entity goes for a loan on the third of uh, what is it the 10th of march 2022 that they at least have their 2021 financial statements available right that is relevant information and that is timely information as well if it is not uh, timely, then it is also probably not relevant. We can go back to relevance as well. Right, ladies and gentlemen, understandability simply means that uh, it must be clear. Uh, it must be clear and it must be concise. This is basically what it states in the last sentence here. So it must be clear. You must not jumble it up uh, and it must not contain so much information that it becomes unreadable. If I can just mention a few examples here, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see uh, when we drop financial statements, we want each statement to be only on one page, right? Now, how do we achieve that? We are going to talk about that into the future. But your statement of comprehensive income should not be over two or three or four pages because then it becomes unclear and it is not concise anymore, which makes it less understandable. The user wants to look at one page and get a summary of the performance of that entity. The same with your statement of financial position. You don't want that to run over two or three or four pages. Then it becomes unclear. Then it is not concise anymore, which makes it less understandable for the user. So if you present all, everything in your statement of financial position on one page, then it becomes more understandable, right? We'll talk about how we achieve that in the future, but you get the idea to be understandable. You must not clutter up your financial statements with all sorts of irrelevant and immaterial items that has got no use to the user of the financial statements. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we get to the probably the most important part because this is going to form the basis. This is going to form the basis of all the work that we are going to be doing over the next few, I can almost say over the next few months, because we are going to look at, be looking at the accounting equation uh, from the next class onwards. We are going to look at the recording of transactions. We are going to be looking later on after that at the reporting of certain uh, uh, transactions and certain events ladies and gentlemen but before we can do that before we can do that 
we must know the elements of the financial statements. Now, what is meant by the elements of financial statements? Ladies and gents, I need to pause here for a, for, a, for a few seconds. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and some of them are trick questions. The first one, if you think to some other, some other subjects you had at school, where did you also find the term elements? You can type for me, please. Thank you so much for all those answers. Thank you so much. Right. Business studies. Yes, you've mentioned all of them correctly and, and all sorts of them. The ones that I was looking for, uh, many of you typed their, their, their physical sciences. Some of you typed their physics. Yes, that is actually also we at school in a, in a completely different uh, subject. But I know you also find in, in business studies and, and economics and so forth. But when it comes to physics or chemistry, right, what does those elements mean? Those elements mean the very basic building blocks of matter. Does that make sense? The building blocks of everything we see and feel and touch and smell and hear around us, right? The very building blocks of nature or of matter. All of those elements are, uh, uh, are presented in a specific table. Those of you who had physical science, what do they call that table? You can type that for me, please. The periodic table. Thank you, Keegan. The periodic table. Thank you, Nalita. Right. So the periodic table contains all the elements that makes up everything that we have around us. Thank you all for those answers, the periodic table. So our very first element, which only has one atom and only has one electron, is hydrogen. It is the hydrogen. Thank you. It is the lightest substance there is. Nothing is lighter than it. It is even lighter than air. The second element which contains two protons and two electrons is, you can type for me there, I'm not going to go further than that, helium. Thank you, helium, ladies and gentlemen. It is also so light that it is lighter than air. So both of those, helium and hydrogen, uh, if you, if you, if you uh, 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 pump that into a balloon, what does the balloon do on Earth? What does the balloon do if you pump helium or hydrogen into it? Float or rises, right? So it goes, pew, shoots up into the air. There we go, up. It shoots up into the sky and you'll never see it again, <laughs> okay? Unless it gets caught in, in electrical wires or something, right? And then you get combinations, ladies and gentlemen. You get combinations like uh, 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 two, two, two hydrogen items with one oxygen uh, 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 atom, right? So two hydrogen atoms with one oxygen atom. What is that chemical formula? Water, water, thank you, it's H2O, right? H2O and that is our ordinary plain common water, right? So water is not an element, but it is a combination of two kinds of elements, right? They combine to form water. Right, ladies and gentlemen, sorry. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, uh, Mr. Eski Dube. This was just an introduction to what elements mean. Don't worry. What I, why I started with that, and this is not a chemistry lesson, I was just, I was just sort of bringing context, as, 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 as they say, right? 
the elements of financial statements are also the basic building blocks of your financial statement just like those those various elements in physics like they are the basic building blocks of material these are the basic building blocks of your financial statements right and what are they there are five of them ladies and gentlemen there are five and we must know i've got to give you a hint here we must know these definitions pretty well and then later on we must also be able to apply them we must be able to apply them when we get to practical situations so what are the five elements ladies and gentlemen firstly assets and again those students who had accounting at school must forgive us because we, not everyone has had accounting at school so we have to start right at the beginning so the five elements the five basic building blocks of financial statements are assets the good things liabilities what you owe income the, 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 the resources that you generate expenses resources that you have to spend in order to receive services or goods and equity equity being the difference between assets and liabilities in other words what what value in the business belongs to the owners right so the equity represents the interest that the owners have in that particular entity right ladies and gentlemen then we've got uh, definitions for each of those elements and these like i say you've got to know them but you're also going to need to apply them so today we're just going to start knowing them we start going to memorize them and in the future we'll apply them so an asset ladies and gentlemen is defined as a present economic resource controlled by the entity resulting from past events right so the definition of an asset has got three criteria we very often refer to this as the definition criteria right so remember the term when it comes to the definition remember also the term very often we break it up into into components and those components we refer to as the definition criteria so an asset is a present economic resource we're going to look at note one just now controlled by the entity resulting from past events now let's analyze this ladies and gentlemen first of all what is meant by a present economic resource well the word present means now right it must be now not 10 days ago not 10 days into the future now so it must be a present it must be an economic resource now and what is an economic resource? They further define that term, that term, sorry, not put present, just that term. They further define it here. They say an economic resource is defined as a right. And that is quite an important term for us because we are going to encounter it in auditing next year. We are going to encounter it in, in, in other subjects such as uh, uh, commercial law as well. So it is a right that has the potential to produce economic benefits. And those of you who had accounting at school and in, in, in those of you who still use the old framework at school will notice that this definition is slightly different now. Uh, and Mr. Adams, yes. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Can I just give an example? Say, for instance, I am, I've got a motorbike with a container on it, and I stand and I have a contract with McDonald's or uh, Steers. Okay? Now, without that motorbike, I cannot do a service. Remember, somebody place an order over uh, over the telephone or on their phone via an app and say they want certain food to be delivered or miss the 60 minutes that they advertise on the tv or the radio without that machine being there and the driver i cannot have 
future potential income, isn't it so, if an order needs to be delivered? Wouldn't that be part of like a, a resource that you have, the motorbike, to collect the goods, you get a fee for the effort delivery, and therefore you would have an economic as an asset. Thank you, Mr. Adams. That that was that was a very good example. Let's let's use Mr. Adams' example step by step there, right? Uh, thank you, Mr. Adams, for that. Uh, okay, so first of all, uh, let's say this is an independent, like Mr. D Food or, or, or Uber Eats, right? So it's an independent, independent deliverer, not not part of of that restaurant at all. Independent deliverer, so he runs his own little business here, right? So now. Like Mr. Adams said there, he has a motorbike, right? A motor, motorbike that he's going to deliver the food with. Now, the first thing, is it a present thing? Does he own it at that point in time? If you can type for me yes or no. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Keegan. Right. Thank you, Maron. Yes, everyone. Thank you. So it is currently, it is, it's part of this def definition now. Now we've got to ask ourselves, is it an economic resource, that motorbike, right? So in order to answer, and, and I saw somebody earlier ask how to answer these questions, this is exactly it. So if you get a question like this, you've got to analyze it like we are doing now. So now we've got to judge, is that motorbike an economic resource? So therefore, we first of all have to look at, does this person have the right to drive that motor vehicle, to operate that motorbike, I should say. Remember, he's the owner. He owns that motorbike. So that means that ownership provides him with the right to drive that motorbike. Agreed? Yes? No? Yes, thank you so much. Right. So that part has definitely been, been that complies with that part. Now, by driving, he has the right, okay? So he has the right because he owns it. It's his property. Now, by driving that, that motorbike from that restaurant where he picks up the food and delivers it to the customer, they he will get a fee for that, right? They will pay him, let's say, 15 rand or 20 rands for, for, for each delivery, right? So my question is, you can just type yes or no. Does that mean that motorbike gives him the potential to produce economic benefits? Yes. Okay. So what does that mean? It means it is a thank you for all those yeses. And thank you again for that example, Mr. Adams. That is actually a perfect one. So it clearly is a present economic resource. So the first criterion of this asset definition has been satisfied. Now let's look at the second one. Is it so, controlled by the entity? In this case, the entity is the driver who is also the owner. Does he control that motorbike? He owns it, so yes, it is certainly under his control. He can drive it wherever he needs to go. So again, it satisfies the second component. Yes, Mr. Adams, please go ahead. Mr. Van Rensburg, can I just get to the potential to produce economic benefits? That motorbike now, currently, by having it and having a contract with the various institutions or that businesses that requires his services, he's automatically getting future potential economic benefits. Remember, when the order is placed and he needs to deliver, every time he delivers a product to the from their cust from the customers, he's actually generating potential benefits. The reason why I thought of this now, because I see these these motorbikes since the start of COVID and they, that business has just suddenly actually um, escalate, uh, escalated in revenue for the delivery services. That is absolutely okay. true. That is, I actually made use of because during COVID, lots of people didn't want to go out of their house. So what did they do? They place an order on the internet or on the phone, the app, and 60 minutes will deliver the goods directly to you and you pay a charge fee. And if you want to pay a person a 
tip for doing a good service, you also may automatically on the app you're giving it. I'm just trying to use like a little bit of AI technology that people were utilizing during the time and you can even track when the person is arriving within that 60 minutes. Thank you. Mr. I, hope I, I hope I brought something to the party there now. Yes, thank you so much. You certainly have. That is such a good example. Like I say, we, we made use of one of them, uh, Mr. D food yesterday, and we, we, we make use of them often. You know, my wife sometimes comes <coughs> home only at about six o'clock, and I work even tonight. I've got an evening class until quarter past seven, so neither of us can cook food. So I guess tonight it will once again be either Mr. D food or, or Uber Eats for us. Uh, but but like you say, Mr. like Mr. Adam says there, it has boomed since since COVID. Obviously, that I think that must be probably the quickest growing industry worldwide. Uh, I know that you know if if you go if you go to any shopping center and you and you look at some of those those eateries, some of those restaurants, you'll see that they've got placards, Mr. DQ year, Mr. Uh, uh, Uber Eats Q year. And they've got many drivers, right? So certainly, there you have it, right? And then we can ask, Mr. Adams actually already already answered the next one, uh, resulting from past events. What is the past event? The fact that they've been granted the contract to deliver the food on behalf of that eatery or, or that restaurant, right? So your, 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 your past event, what happened in the past? This person was granted a, the permission or the right you can already call that a right as well uh, um, to 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 deliver the the the, uh, um, the foods and the cool drinks and the milkshakes and whatever on behalf of the restaurant, right? And the past event is when they were given that right when they concluded that agreement. Okay, ladies and gents, I hope that one is now clear. A liability is basically opposite of that, ladies and gentlemen. A liability is the opposite of an asset. Uh, let me just go and have a peek at the chat. Did I go too deep into the past event? It just basically means that something must have happened somewhere in the past that that presented this entity with that economic resource which he or she controls, right? And that would normally be you have purchased something or you've signed an agreement for something. In this case, it would be signing an agreement that you are now be, become our official deliverer of, of the uh, foods and drinks and whatnot. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we'll, we'll have to call it a day after the liability because I know that we have to finish at 5-2. You've got a class at another class at one o'clock. We've got a meeting at one o'clock. So all sorts of things happened at one o'clock. So let's just look at the liability definition briefly. And then the, the other three we'll look at next time. Mr. Adams, I'm going to eat into your time again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it looks like I've got no choice. So liability is not a present economic resource. It's still present. So it's not something last year or last week or next week. It's a present, but now not economic resource, but an obligation. And again, we're going to explain what an obligation is later on. So it must be, first of all, a present obligation. Secondly, to transfer an economic resource. So you're going to transfer some economic resource, either cash or some other asset, out of your resources to transfer an economic resource, also resulting from a past event or past events. Let me just go to uh, elaborate. Uh, Lungani, yes? Yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, sir. Uh, is, liability, is liability plus equity equal to assets, sir? If you add liabilities and equity, can they equal to an asset? Exactly, exactly. That is part of what Mr. Adams is going to be discussing with you. They, they often refer to that as the accounting equation. So that is exactly it. So your, your, your assets, less your liabilities, give you your equity. All the way you put it, also, the, 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 also true, a liability, your, all your total liabilities plus your total equity will equal your total assets. 
spot on spot on there thank you for that mr adams like i said is going to start talking about exactly that uh, in our next class okay uh, so and then again the uh, pardon i couldn't hear that part That is also using the balance sheets. Yes, exactly. Those are also the three elements you find in your statement of financial position. Spot on again, right? So, uh, and then also resulting from past events. Uh, and then note two just says, explains to us what is an obligation. An obligation is a duty, some sort of a duty that the entity has that it has no practicable, practical, sorry, practical ability to avoid, right? So an obligation is a duty that the entity has no practical ability to avoid. We must, uh, we must finish off, Mr. Adams. Would you like to add something about liability here, perhaps? Um, yes, I can talk about the liability. Think about this, the motorbike guy, he actually, before he has to buy his, uh, get, get that asset, he needed to go look for somebody to, to sponsor him or fund him. So now what he does, he goes to an organization and he says, okay, I need this asset. So the asset that will then be, be financed through somebody. And that is a form of liability. Okay, so that automatically creates a future potential duty that he needs to pay in installments because he doesn't have the full cash to pay say 18 to 20,000 to start that that motorbike thing okay I hope that will help you Mr. Van Rensburg yes thank you so much Mr. Adams that is perfect that is su such a good example again so he this this particular delivery person had to to do to finance the purchase of that motorbike right so that means it's it's almost like a loan, right? So he owes the money. So that means it is an obligation, uh, which means that there is a duty that he has to repay the loan. And he cannot avoid that because if he doesn't repay it, what's going to happen? They are going to go to court. They're going to get a notice of attachment. And then they're going to take that motorbike back, right? And they're going to sell it at an auction to, 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 to service the loan, right? So they will sue him. So he's okay. got... He or she has no practical ability to avoid that. And the transfer of economic resources, so the obligation is he will or she will have to pay installments monthly on that loan until that loan has been fully paid and it resulted from a financing trans financing agreement with that bank. Yes, Mr. Adams? Um, Mr. Van Rensburg, some people said we need to make more clarity about it. Uh, um, I think you were very clear about the financing of the asset. If you look at it, corresponding the asset compared to the liability. Because if you look at it, if you look in accounting, you would have to do a journal entry. You bought the asset, you would debit the asset, the motor vehicle or the um, motorbike. You will credit the corresponding liability called like F and B or um, West Bank or APSA Finance, those would be or whichever liability company. And at the end of the day, you while you are making money, at the end of a specific day, you need to pay and they will debit order your bank account for the recovery of your installment that you need to pay. I hope that will help. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue uh, where we are now next time. Mr. Adams, I apologize up front that I'm going to eat a little bit into your time. Hopefully not more than half an hour, if that's all right. No with problem. You. Right. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. I know that you've got another class to go to. We'll see you next time. Thank you all. Have a lovely afternoon. We'll see you soon and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Mr. Van Rensburg, can you just...